This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, and we are Navigating the Journey. Navigating the Journey is dedicated to exploring the options and choices for the end of life care and to assist people to talk about their wishes. It's time to transform our culture so we shift from not talking about dying to talking about it. It is time to share the way we want to live our lives at the end of our lives and to communicate about the kind of care we want and don't want. We believe that that place is to begin here and now and not in the intensive care unit. So together, we explore the various paths to life ending, and together we can make those difficult conversations easier. Together, we can make sure our own wishes and those of our loved ones are expressed and respected. So if you're ready, we ask you to navigate the journey. Today, we have a young uh, member. I think he's the youngest member Third youngest, uh, third youngest. Third youngest, third youngest. <laughs> member of the legislature and one of the newest. And he is also, and I, I, everybody knows I'm a political junkie and I've probably never said this before, but he's also a hero. He's a cancer survivor and a coach. And his kids said, in writing, that he was their hero. And if his kids say, teenagers say someone is a hero, that is just the best thing. And for a politician, that's gold. I'm, <laughs> no, I'm not on his campaign staff. <laughs> but I do want you to meet Representative Chris Todd from the Big Island. And he is the newest, no, second newest. Yeah, with the new appointment of yes. Mr. Lermont. And um, when Cliff Sujit died last year, I guess it was, no, 16, no, mm -hmm. the year changed, he was appointed by the governor to take his place. And I can't imagine that there was a better candidate. <laughs> oh, thank you. When, his, when, when your own community says this is a hero, I mean, what choice do we have but to have a politician which has become a dirty word, to be felt like that by their community. So welcome, Chris. Oh, thank you for having me here. And so now that I've told all about you, and he is also a cancer survivor, and we love cancer survivors. So <laughs> uh, tell us about Chris. Oh, uh, great. Well, uh, I'm Chris Todd, <laughs> and I like to describe myself as the new guy. Um, and uh, prior to being appointed, you know, I was born and raised in Hilo, uh, went to public schools. I'm a third generation graduate of Hilo High School. And uh, my degree at UH Hilo is in economics and political science. And pretty much the day after graduation, I went to work uh, actually at a Suisan Fish Market, which is a very old kind of institution in Hilo. And uh, eventually ended up uh, managing their operations on the retail side where we made the poke and dry fish and all that stuff. The big New Year's Eve. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, you know, even though I kind of grew up in politics because my mom was uh, on the county council, you know, still that transition from the fish market, you know, and uh, I was uh, working for a paper product distributor uh, to the legislature is, you know, pretty, pretty substantial. Wow. So you've lived most of your life, if not all of it, on, on the Big Island. Yeah. Uh, pretty much the only time I've been out of state other than on you know quick trips uh, i was in las vegas for four or five months uh, for a semester of college and then oh ran that's right the 51st yeah. state we don't count yeah, yeah, we don't count no, technicality. <laughs> yeah. yeah so what made you decide to that you wanted to take cliff suji's place so it's it's kind of a strange story um i think what what happened for me personally is i was hesitant um, even though i always felt um that calling in a sense uh, but the, the presidential election, you know, Donald Trump and that whole thing, it, it really, really bothered me. Uh, so, I, so I went to my family and I, I wanted to get more involved, thinking a few years down the road, 
you know, maybe if uh, Rep Suji was going to retire, we could have that conversation uh, about running may maybe in 2020 or 2022. Uh, but the day that I'm meeting with my family to have this conversation, we find out that Rep Suji had passed away. Um, it was that morning. So, you know, I, I kind of deferred to my uncle and my mom guys, and, and they said, you should put your name in because it's good to let people know you're interested and to go through the process, but there's no chance you get appointed. And then I got appointed. <laughs> so uh, here I am, and, you know, last year was kind of, you know, you know, kind of right in front of the fire hose in a sense. You know, oh, it was. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> getting, a, getting a, you know, a full exposure to everything that the legislature has to offer, but I'm feeling a lot more comfortable now having gone through that process. So what committees are you on? So for this upcoming session, I'll be on the Finance Committee, I'll be the Vice Chair for the uh, Water and Land Committee, and also serving on Energy and Environmental Protection. And Human Services, Health and Human so, Services? So the past session, I was on uh, Human Services, Health, and Consumer Protection, mm -hmm. uh, but transitioning this year. So you're not on Health and Human Services? No, not for this upcoming session. But yesterday they had your name. Uh, I, I think that was kind of a relic. They haven't made the official change, but that's going to be my uh, new positions mm -hmm. for this upcoming session. Oh, okay. I was looking forward to you being there oh. <laughs> when I saw all the, you know, they le wrote, line up the names. Right, right, right. Yeah, so the, the change should become official sometime in the next few days. So we don't know who's on your place. Um, I know Lay. Yeah, is. I know uh, Rep. Lairmont's going to be there, and some of the prior members. But I'm not sure on the specific makeup. I, I don't know if they've, you know, fully, you know, completed that process yet. Mm -hmm. So on land and water and what else? Uh, environmental protection, um, as well as the finance committee. Uh huh. Well, everybody's on finance, right? The Fifteen of us. Yes. <laughs> quite, quite a few. Quite a few. <laughs> so now, of course. As you know, our program is dedicated to uh, the end of life processes mm -hmm. and care. And for the last year and a half, we have had people from every walk of life, ministers, rabbis, imams, priests, everybody, to talk about the end of life mm -hmm. in their culture, in their sure. ethnic group, how people deal with it mm -hmm. and what have you tell me this is not political i mean i don't right, right. tell me um are you hawaiian no uh so my my family's origin story in a way is complicated no that uh, no because i was gonna yeah. ask is, <laughs> um, is there a tradition in your family in um, of the end of life uh, I think we're we're pretty. I, I guess what you'd consider like an average, you know, local family in that sense. Uh, so probably you know burial or cremation, um, but nothing nothing necessarily tied to a host culture or anything like that. Yeah. So um, for me, mm -hmm. I thought the Japanese Buddhist was the best, even though I'm not obviously not Japanese or Buddhist. Right. But they celebrate with the dying person mm -hmm. while he is or she is still with us sure. and they do all the things that the christians do in a funeral they do with the patient mm -hmm. they they tell them how much they care for them and what they meant in their life and all of these wonderful things prior to mm -hmm. their passing so that it is a pleasant passing and the uh imam the Muslims said that they tell stories and get the person ready to go to mm -hmm. wherever that is. And so that was what I was asking. What, mm -hmm. if there's mm -hmm. anything special your family mm -hmm. does at the end as a person? Yeah, not, not off the top of my head. Uh, so I, I'm not sure exactly. I'm sure it's kind of <laughs> similar up here in Oahu, but uh, a lot of times, you know, funeral services uh, on the Big Island. They're, they're a very, you know, big food event. Oh, yes. So that's, that's usually what people talk about after the fact is the food and, you know, what kind of spread there was, well, actually. Yeah, well, local people will <laughs> forgive you anything if the food is good. Yeah. 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 So, but, but during the actual dying process, not, nothing, I, I guess, you know, that's, I've been very fortunate 
Um, mm -hmm. You know, for, for my mom, her parents passed away when she was a teenager. So she had to go through that process at a very, oh, very early yeah. age. Um, but, you know, for me, I've been kind of insulated from that. My parents are still around. Um, and even though my grandparents have all passed away, none of them were in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. uh, they were in Japan and on the mainland. So I, I haven't had to deal with that on that personal level mm -hmm. um, in the way that a lot of people have by my age. Yeah. So, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, I don't, really don't like not being well. Anyway, <laughs> so now with this bill mm -hmm. that's before the legislature, medical aid and dying, sure. and there's so many misnomers. Tell me what you think or how you feel about it. This is, you know, mm -hmm. not, I'm not asking you to vote. I'm right, just talking right. about, you know, personal. What mm -hmm. do you feel? So I think for me, it, it comes down to, you know, personal freedom. And, you know, from that perspective, obviously, if I'm in that sort of situation, uh, or if a loved one's in that sort of situation where they're, they're in pain and, you know, they're, they're terminally ill and they know the end is near, I would like them to be able to go out on their own terms. And so for me, that's what this issue is about. It's, it's preventing human suffering, but also allowing people that, that last choice. You know, we allow choice in so many other areas, but not at the end of life right now. And what we've seen is that in other states where they have similar legislation, it's a relatively small number of people who actually utilize the process, but it, it definitely uh, can be a very comforting feeling for those families, knowing that they don't have to go through that end of life pain and suffering the same way that they would otherwise. Yeah, we're going to take a break, and we'll be back in 60 seconds. And at that <clears throat> time, if, uh, if we can really go through the sure. bill and see if there's anything that you felt uncomfortable about. Right. Okay? We'll right. be Thank right you. back. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Freedom. Is it a feeling? Is it a place? Is it an idea? At Dive Heart, we believe freedom is all of these and more, regardless of your ability. Dive Heart wants to help you escape the bonds of this world and defy gravity. Since 2001, Dive Heart has helped children, adults, and veterans of all abilities go where they have never gone before. Dive Heart has helped them transition to their new normal. Search DiveHeart.org and share our mission with others, and in the process, help people of all abilities imagine the possibilities in their lives. Aloha, welcome to Hawaii. This is Prince Dykes, your host of the Prince of Investing, coming to you guys each and every Tuesday at 11 a.m. right here on Think Tech Hawaii. Don't forget to come by and check out some of the great information on stocks, investings, your money, all the other great stuff, and I'll be your host. See you too. Aloha, and we're back, and we're talking to our new hero. <laughs> <laughs> I never thought I'd say that about a politician. <laughs> But it's a pleasure. Uh, this young man, Chris Todd, from Hilo, from District 2. Mm -hmm. And um, for anyone that's counting, Hilo number is our first district, of course. Yeah, the kind of North Hilo to yes. Honoka. Yeah. It begins with District 1 and ends here in Honolulu, in Waimanalo with District 51. Mm -hmm. So it goes up, then around, and back. Not that anybody cares. <laughs> <laughs> but so we're talking about medical aid and dying. Mm -hmm. And last year, uh, Chris was on the committee that heard the bill in mm -hmm. health, the health committee. And so I would like for you to tell me your feelings about if there was something that wasn't clear, sure. that should have been clear. Mm -hmm. If we can answer any of those questions, because if you didn't understand, I'm sure there's part of our audience that didn't understand. Mm -hmm. Okay. So can you tell me those? Sure. Uh, so I think for me, uh, you know, my interest is making sure that once we put this policy into place, that it can survive, you know, mm -hmm. that it's here for the long haul. Mm -hmm. So uh, with that in mind, I try to identify certain areas of risk where, you know, let's say that a certain part of the bill uh, you know, like as an example, you would you would get this uh, prescription after this uh, pretty lengthy evaluation process to make sure you're yeah. you know, mentally competent. Uh, but you take the prescription home, you administer it home. So my concern is, you know, maybe someone you know uses 
uh, this prescription, you know, for medical aid and dying, but changes their mind or, or something, something strange like that happens. And they go through this medical emergency, but they don't have uh, a physician there, they don't have a nurse there, uh, or anyone from law enforcement who could care for them. So while I believe that even in the, the previous form of last year, that this, you know, the pros definitely outweigh the cons, and that this is kind of like a extreme scenario, uh, my preference would be that there are uh, a, a few more regulations in place and that you know, the paperwork and accounting for a lot of the stuff is a little bit more stringent. Um, but with that being said, e even in its current form, you know, SB, uh, I think it was 1129, it, it's still a net benefit. I just want to make sure that this is protected so that if you have a high profile case that it doesn't derail the whole thing. Well, a lot of that happens in uh, the health department when they go through sure. and with all bills and yeah. then it never looks never mm -hmm. anyway uh, you're saying about somebody being with them yeah. and that that's fine there's mm -hmm. no problem with someone being with them it's just that someone cannot administer correct. it correct correct now for anyone that says why not mm -hmm. there is a law on the books that says, no matter what condition you're in, sure. if I assist you in dying, I am charged with manslaughter. So mm -hmm. to protect the doctor, the nurse, yeah. we cannot. It's very difficult. Yeah, unless of course we go and work at changing the law, sure. which our attorney general said, that's what we need to do. Because he's mm -hmm. agreeing, like you, he's agreeing that yes, we want somebody with them, but, but they yeah. cannot cannot assist. That's where you get into liability in a legal the, sense, even yeah. But that's when you don't want someone that's sure. that is love going to help you out of love and then be charged with manslaughter. Definitely. So that's I know that's crazy. Yeah. But that's part of the problem. Yeah. No, I think anytime you're dealing with something you know as complex and emotional as death. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you're gonna you're gonna have issues pop up. So there's there's no such thing as a perfect piece of legislation, and you know I was prepared last year with that legislation to pass it um, at least onto the next committee with with some of our concerns issued. Uh, but hopefully this session we we have something reintroduced or or work being done on that existing bill to take care of some of some of those details to make it a little bit more palatable. Um, but I just want the end result to be uh, sustainable, I guess. What well, one of the things that the um, evangelical Christian right has said repeatedly mm -hmm. is that this is physicians assisted suicide. Yeah. It is neither physicians assisted nor is it suicide. Mm -hmm. If I have cancer, which I have had, the cancer is eating up the body, not you're not committing suicide. It's mm -hmm. you have all before you can get the prescription. You've already reached the point where right. there's nothing it, we can it's do. It's inevitable. Yeah, nothing we can do. Yeah, and but they keep telling that, mm -hmm. and they keep talking about old people. Well, okay, I am old, <laughs> but does that mean it's terminal? We're mm -hmm. all terminal. Yeah, but sure, just sure. being old doesn't meet meet the requirement of the bill. Mm -hmm. And then they talk about the handicap. Handicap is not terminal. Mm -hmm. But they keep saying this over and over again. So that's why I'm going with this, with asking you these questions. What else, other than those obvious sure. things, what else? Anything else that jumps out at you that says, maybe we need to fix this? Well, I think for me, that was the major issue, actually. It was, was more of the paperwork and some of fine-tuning some of the details um, I, I know I, I had a lot of advocates for the disabled community come in and talk to me, but but I, I personally I don't see I don't see that in the future. I, I know they're concerned about uh, this being expanded later on, but but I don't see that happening. I mean, you can see with our own reluctance to pass even something as limited as this, where you have to be within the last six months and you have to pass all the mental uh, competency exams. So I feel like that's that's not realistic, um, and a lot of the cultural concerns. I understand, uh, but I think this is the difference for me between this um, and other, you know, very complicated issues. Is that uh, this isn't something that directly harms anyone else. No, you know, this is an individual choice. Like I said, it prevents that mm. suffering at the end of life, and 
for me, if, 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 you're not, if you're doing no harm to those around you, you should have those personal freedoms. Uh, and let me explain to our audience who have, have not read the bill. Um, it says clearly that you have to be terminally ill mm -hmm. within six months. Yeah. And that no one in your family who stands to gain from your mm -hmm. demise can assist in drawing up the papers that are necessary. Yes. That is a class A felon. Mm -hmm. And so it's not, so if people want to get rid of grandma, they can find a way to do it. <laughs> you know, you don't need this bill. People, every day right. we read about people getting rid of somebody. Mm -hmm. So they don't need this bill. And if grandma has an estate, let me tell you, folks, if grandma has an estate and you put her in Queens Hospital, those last days of her life, all hooked up, that is a minimum of $10,000 a day. So when grandma does pass after all of that, and then she leaves you with the bill, mm -hmm. do you really want that? Is that the way you want to remember grandma? Mm -hmm. $10,000 a day. Yeah, and I think that's the other reality, you know, with our, our growing cost of living, you know, you don't want people to make these decisions for financial reasons. Um, but if I'm in that situation, you know, let's say down the road, you know, and I'm six months or less, and I see the burden this is placing on my family, I want the ability to make that choice for my family. Whenever you're ready. Right, exactly. You, you don't want, like I said, the bill is constructed in a way where, you know, you can't, uh, people can't apply undue pressure, you know, because okay. we're always concerned about, you know, abuse of our senior citizens. Um, but if they are in that situation, I know that if I'm in that exact situation, and I have that choice made available to me, you know, you at least have to consider it. You don't want to bankrupt your children or your spouse at the end of life. So I, I think it's, you know, we, this isn't something that's going to be forced on anyone, but they should have the ability to choose for themselves. Now, one uh, doctor, Dr. Uh, Sykes, she said that so many doctors aren't ready for this. Mm -hmm. Well, no doctor is compelled to take part in this if for some reason they're not comfortable with it. They don't have to be trained. Mm -hmm. They are trained. That's where the MD comes from. But if for some reason they feel that they can't do this, there's nothing that compels them to do it. Right. And, you know, I'm, obviously I'm, I'm not a doctor. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I'm, I'm definitely not an expert on that field. Uh, so you have, to, you have to take into consideration, you know, that sort of testimony. Uh, but, but for me, I guess, you know, this isn't something that needs to be implemented immediately. This is something that, you know, you can, you can give that window of time to provide adequate training. That can be written into the bill. This, isn't, this is a decision we're making that we want to stand the test of time, that we want to benefit people not only next year, but 10 years from now and 20 years from now. So, you know, we shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah. Those are concerns that need to be uh, addressed. Mm -hmm. but they shouldn't be the reason we are not able to pass this bill. Oh, yes. And then there was another uh, person that brought up about the, the certain things aren't open to the public about mm. this patient. Well, with the HIPAA, sure. nothing is open to the public. And it shouldn't be. And it shouldn't be. That's, that's their individual <clears throat> right. Yeah, that's, why do we need to know? Mm -hmm. You know, the person is already ill with whatever the disease is. Sure. That's enough. Mm -hmm. We don't need to know anything else, yeah. I don't think. Yeah, so I think, you know, on my end, when I was looking at some of the reporting requirements, and that's something I'd like to see strengthened in a sense, but not for public consumption. You know, this is something where, hey, maybe five years uh, into this program, and, you know, what we've seen on the mainland is that very few people actually go through with this process. So you might be talking about, you know, five years in Hawaii, maybe a, a dozen or two, mm -hmm. I mean, may, maybe a little bit more. And that's that aggregate information could be made available to policymakers, provided that you know privacy and all of those requirements that this is kept confidential. Mm -hmm. But this isn't public knowledge, and no one's health uh, situation should be made you know public unless they ask it right. to be. You know. Well, and with hospice, for instance, uh, the hospice nurse 
signs off on the death certificate. Mm -hmm. They don't say anything else except the fact that this is comes from hospice. It is taken that everything is fine. The person passed away. Time, place, and whatnot, sure. and they sign. There's no question about what was the cause of death, what was any of this. No. Mm -hmm. And this should be treated the same way. Mm -hmm. Because if you come to that part, it is probably you are in hospice. It's very likely, mm -hmm. very likely. And so there's, I, I, there's so many of this mm -hmm. nonsense. It seems nonsense. Mm -hmm. but yeah, and I, I think I'm looking forward to you know, the, the relevant committees having the discussion again. I feel like going through that process and in the two to three hour hearing last time and, and hearing uh, a variety of viewpoints, it was very informative. Um, but you know, beyond that, I, I think there's a lot of public value just in having the discussion. And, and I do feel like this is something that we are going to pass. I'm hopeful for this upcoming session. Um, but even if it does you know, take a, a longer process, I, I do feel like we're headed in that direction that this is a conversation that people are having with their loved ones you know, all across the country. And, and the, the less we you know, keep death shrouded in this mystery and, and not talk about it, the better off we all are. Mm -hmm. Well, and then at that last hearing that was packed, and everybody got one minute to speak, that's not very informative. We've said more in, mm -hmm. in the last 25 minutes, <laughs> you know, and then there's so much more to go mm -hmm. that really, unless we can have an informational briefing where there's more discussion, sure. more give and take, but one minute, that's not very much. Yeah, it, it, and you know, I was witness to it, and, and it can be very difficult you know, to balance you know, when you, when you have 120 yes. or so uh, people are trying to provide input, it, it can be very difficult. And, and I, I, think, I think you're right. I think we're, we are better served by having something very public. And I think, you know, in, in terms of good governance, people always feel better about an outcome if, if they feel like they've been heard okay. on an issue. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's something we can hopefully do a little bit better going forward. Well, it's been a real pleasure spending this time with you. Mm -hmm. And we look forward as the session goes on for you to come back and keep sure, us updated anytime, on what, what you're mm -hmm. doing, especially what's going on in the Big Island. Oh, that's always a good time. So. Yes. Well, <laughs> right, thank, thank you. you so much. Aloha, and we'll see you next time.